Hi everyone. Um, so tonight we have uh, Willie Moffat, who will be uh, discussing uh, what was the first passive house in, in Northern Ireland, uh, completed back in uh, 2011. Uh, Willie is a certified passive house consultant uh, and director uh, with Moffat and Robinson uh, Construction Limited, uh, first established as a partnership in 1983 and then as a limited company in 2007. Um, initially working on domestic uh, product uh, projects, uh, but now uh, many types of construction, both uh, commercial and residential, but with a focus on uh, energy efficiency. Um, having always had an interest in energy conservation, uh, Willie has invested uh, 12 years research and development, um, uh, resulting in the design of his own timber frame uh, system, which has uh, since achieved. Uh, Passive House Components Certification. Um, so really looking forward to uh, Willie's uh, talk this evening. And, um, uh, but before I hand over, if I could just ask everyone to put any questions in the chat. Um, I'll then try to field those at the end. We'll try and collate them together and, and uh, 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 manage that process. Um, again, if I could just ask anyone who's joined since the start, if uh, you could mute your mics. Um, and uh, uh, for now then, over to you, Willie. Right, uh, thank you, uh, Simon and Barry. Uh, and I've just lost my... Uh... Just give me a wee minute here, yep. Unmute. You know? Right, can everybody hear me? Yeah, we can, yeah. Yeah, that's okay. Right, we'll um, move off as a hello to everybody and I say thank you, uh, Barry and Simon and uh, Yvonne. Um, for you who don't know me, my name is Willie Moffat, uh, Moffat and Robinson Construction Limited. We're a small construction company based outside Oma, the county of Tyrone, Northern Ireland here. Uh, We've been accredited with designing and constructing Northern Ireland's first certified passive house. And the house is also the second carbon zero in Northern Ireland. Uh, we didn't set out to build a zero carbon or passive house, but we developed a fabric first approach and harnessed any energy produced. We looked anywhere heat could be lost, such as thermal bridging, ventilation to combustible appliances, uh, extract fans from kitchens, bathrooms, tumble dryers, and trickle vents to windows. Uh, we also looked at uh, where we could save energy, low energy lighting, using A-rated appliances with preheat facilities, and even a standard septic tank as opposed to a treatment plant. Uh, which can use up to 130 pounds a year um, in electric. Uh, we then looked at where we could gain energy, um, like some natural solar gain, solar hot water panels and PV panels and a wood burning stove. That's a picture just of the house there. So um, the Passive House Institute have it down to a science with a calculation for every aspect of the building. But at that time, we found that uh, much could be achieved by taking a common sense approach. Uh, we rotated the house slightly so it faced due south to take advantage of heat from the sun as much as possible. With an average number of windows in the east and west, more in the south, under evacuated tubes in the south face of the roof, and as few windows as possible in the north. We also sheltered half of the north elevation with a garage. We clustered the wet rooms where possible to reduce the travel distance of hot water. And we created a wide soffit on the south elevation to reduce overheating in the summer. The building was constructed using a standard timber frame uh, construction built on a low thermal conductivity block set on a damp proof course because if the block gets damp, it would improve its conductivity dramatically and result in a cold bridge at the ground level. We used fiberglass insulation in the frame and lined the reveals of the windows with 50 mil polyurethane insulation to reduce thermal bridging. This means the window is completely surrounded in insulation right to the external face. 
we then fitted our airtight membrane and created service void deep enough to prevent a hammer friendly chap with a long nail from being able to puncture the membrane. I found that this type of construction was as contagious as a disease. Uh, he just wanted to get better and better at it. Um, so I learned at this stage that Tomas O'Leary of Mozart was running a passive house academy 30 miles down the road from me and I enrolled. Uh, during the course, this house was discussed and Tomas decided it would be useful for the class to use it for a site visit. After walking through, Tomas advised me that we were very close to, if not already, a passive standard. And to help our cause, he advised us to increase our service void on the wall to achieve an additional 65 mil of insulation and an additional 100 mil on the roof space. So you see there, the suspended ceiling allowed enough depth for air ducts, water pipes and electric wires, meaning all our services were within the insulated airtight envelope of the building. This void was then filled with additional fiberglass insulation. And this also eliminated the common cold bridge at the wall plate level. So our airtight, our airtight membrane was taped to the damp proof membrane onto the floor and a 75 mil upstand polyurethane insulation fitted. And the equivalent of 175 mil of polyurethane insulation under the floor with the joints broken to reduce cold infiltration. This gave us a uniform insulation all around the dwelling and no cold spots at corner junctions. We installed triple glazed windows and composite doors, which were necessary to achieve the passive house status. Uh, they have a heat loss or U value of 0.8 watts per meter squared Kelvin and a G value of over 50%. The G value obviously being the, the amount of heat that they can bring in from the sun. Uh, I did get an independent calculation carried out on our fitting detail and got a negative thermal bridge of minus 0.124. The composite doors have a U value of uh, 0.64. The walls, a U value of 0.11. The ceiling, uh, 0.07. The floor, 0.11. And this completed uh, the thermal envelope. So, the fitting of the mechanical heat recovery ventilation system eliminated the need for traditional extractor fans. I believe this is an excellent addition to any building. It works by using the heat of the stale air extracted from the wet rooms to preheat without mixing the incoming fresh air, which is delivers to the habitable rooms. The cooker hood has a charcoal filter and the tumble dryer is a condensing dryer and there are no extract fans in the bathroom, uh, meaning there is no requirement for direct external vents. The heat from these sources is taken through the ventilation system, which harvests up to 90% for redistribution. With this system, there is no requirement for trickle vents to the windows. In fact, no need to open windows. An ordinary, to give sort of an example of it, an ordinary extractor fan in the bathroom will extract at a rate of 30 litres per second. So, for example, if a bathroom at 2.4 metres cubed with a standard fan, the volume of, of the room will be emptied four times during a 15 minute shower with a 15 minute override on the fan. So, if you can imagine the amount of heat which would be dumped. So by installing the heat recovery system, uh, this heat is harvested and redistributed around the home. A few hidden extras um, have also come to light with the virtual elimination of flies, spiders, and cobwebs, removing the need for chemicals such as fly spray and air fresheners, etc. 
and substantially less dust, reducing energy use and cleaning time. Another observation is the occupant of the house rarely suffers from health issues such as the common cold. As an experiment, the intake of the fresh air from the heat recovery unit is via an underground duct. This helps to stabilize the air temperature. In cold weather, the ground can warm the air and in hot weather, it can cool it, thus reducing overheating in summer. We also source the air from the middle of these trees uh, that you see behind the shed uh, with the idea it would be richer in oxygen content. Uh, we installed a mains flow cylinder. This means that the cold mains water comes in at the bottom of the cylinder, flowing through a coil and comes out hot at the top, heated by the water stored in the body of the cylinder, giving A-grade water at the tap suitable for drinking. The domestic water is mains pressurized, so there's a good flow. This means we can use smaller pipes to deliver hot water, therefore reducing heat loss, water loss, and waiting times at the tap. The water stored in the cylinder is the heating water, which is mainly heated by the solar panels, and when it reaches 55 degrees, is pumped to the radiators. Originally, we had three radiators in the house but had to fit two more to create an effective heat dump during strong sunlight so the solar panels would not overheat and revert to stagnation. We then fitted a multi-fuel stove as backup heating, as a backup heating system, and as a, an uncontrolled heat source, we used an expansion tank on the top of the cylinder. Therefore, there are no pipes or water tanks outside the heated envelope. As an appliance burns, it draws air inwards from leaks in the building, thus cooling the building. With the improvement required in air tightness, it is mandatory to fit a room vent to supply air to a combustible appliance such as this. In this case, we used a stove which has a direct air intake ducted from outside, therefore not impairing the air tightness of the building. To date, the dwelling has recorded a continual 22 weeks without lighting the stove in the summer and 12 days continuous in the winter as the solar panels are providing enough hot water and heating. During more overcast but mild times, the house can maintain the heat levels and the stove is only required every two to three days. To achieve zero carbon status, we had to provide solar PV panels to generate electricity. These were fitted to the shed roof uh, so as not to impair on the aesthetics of the dwelling at the client's request. These ha have the ability to provide a small income, but it is important to try and use as much of the electric as possible as it is generated. Right, uh, the garage is dri a drive through, so no reversion to burn fuel and remote doors to avoid getting wet. We fitted a vaulted ceiling and an electrically operated clothesline to double up as a drying area. Ease of access to the roof space is provided from the garage and doesn't impair on the air tightness of the house. So another quick addition was a, a water harvesting system. We were told the cheapest way to get water is via the mains, but to avoid future potential water rates, we made this low budget water harvesting system. Uh, it collects water at a high level tank. You see it there above the gas cylinders and it flows by gravity to flush the three toilets and provide an outside tap it works very well and has mains backup for use in dry or freezing conditions. We also use trochal PVC in the valleys instead of lead just to reduce contamination. 
and roughly at one millimeter of rain can fill the tank, which will flush the toilet for approximately two weeks. Right. Uh, the wood stove uses approximately one and a third cubic meters of logs annually to provide backup for the heat and hot water. Uh, so here we have the energy performance and environmental impact uh, certificates. Uh, we're very pleased with the results as both are, are at the high end of the A+. Plus. I think as a, an A sits about 92 and we're 111 or 112, I just can't see it here. Mm -hmm. 111 on the uh, energy performance or 118, I think it is an environmental impact. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, air test, uh, standard air tests are measured in air changes per hour at 50 pascals pressure based on the external surface of the building, where we achieved a result of 0.45 air changes per hour. The passive house is a little harder to achieve. It is also measured in air changes per hour at 50 pascals pressure, but is based on the cubic meter volume of the internal of the building. And that the air test there achieved 0.51 air changes per hour. Uh, so we achieved the passive house status for the dwelling. And using this project, I gained my certification as a passive house consultant. I am delighted with this achievement and thankful to the Passive House Institute. Remembering that we didn't set out to achieve a pass to achieve passive, but it does show how much common sense passive house actually is. I personally believe it is the way forward to reduce carbon in the construction industry. Using the fabric forced approach dramatically reduces the levels of maintenance required throughout the building. Any renewables then introduced will operate at their most efficient standard due to the reduced demands of the building that they're installed in. So uh, moving on to, to the house, uh, the Southwest College has followed the house from the beginning and have used it as part of their curriculum. Uh, it was recognized by the UK's largest construction trade body awarding us the UK Master Builder of the Year for energy efficiency. Uh, it has been used by national television during reporting on meeting carbon targets within the construction industry. It was monitored by the Passive Alliance of Builders for a report on significant opportunities of Passive House in conjunction with the University of Ulster and published by Dr. Shane Coakley. It was also monitored for rhythm levels by Dr. Barry McCarran for his PhD and it was presented to a worldwide audience of Camp Hill communities as the way forward for building within their unique environment. Right. Um, and we've, we've, already, we've built two actually for Camp Hill communities since. For ourselves, uh, we have now developed and designed, I think uh, Sam already uh, mentioned, uh, our own timber frame, which has been certified as a passive house building component. We've since developed a revised floor detail, which has resulted in an improvement in the performance of the dwelling and makes achieving air tightness goals much easier. We're continu continually seeking ways to improve and are currently experimenting and researching in conjunction with Barry at the Southwest College. Uh, the viability of a straight electrically powered dwelling and the possibility of recovering heat from wastewater. Uh, also, the mechanical heat recovery ventilation system, I believe, um, has an added benefit in that they can control the humidity levels in a dwelling. Research has shown that if the level uh, of approximately 50% relative humidity is maintained, many viruses struggle to survive, and that would include COVID. So uh, financial implications. Um, 
whilst there can be up to 7 to 10% additional costs over a traditional build, depending on the level of complexity of the dwelling, the occupant is rewarded with a lifetime of savings, something I am pleased to note the lenders are now taking into consideration. With this particular dwelling, it qualified for five years rates exemption, an offer which was available at the time. The one and a third cubic metres uh, of logs are sourced from waste wood available on the farm. The renewable obligation certificates on the PV panels secured a small income. All these benefits resulted in a positive return during the period of rates exemption. As for the homeowner, she is very happy with her home and her investment. She is now driving her second electric car as well, and is proud of the fact that as a mother, grandmother and great grandmother, she can still set an example to the future generations. So passive house standards are stringent and difficult to achieve. But I feel that my experience shows that a small scale builder can reach this level and I know the standards have to be stringent to maintain this exceptional quality of building. My approach now uh, is to use the passive house planning package at the start as it makes it life much simpler during the build process. So that concludes my presentation and I hope and if you have any questions, you're filling them in and we'll try and keep them answered. But uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And um, I hope you find that of interest and uh, maybe some of you be thinking of building that type of house. Thank you. Thanks very much, Willie. Um, really uh, interesting uh, presentation. Um, and I think, you know, huge testament to you who set, setting off on this journey more than 10 years ago um and to you know be very close to passive house without you know even even really realizing it um you know i think says a lot for how you were going about uh, about your work and i think what you said about um you know there's a lot of common sense in there um i, I think you know i would i would echo that um, a lot of this is just um Good attention to detail, good detailing. Um, you're, you know, really thinking the issues out. And, and yes, pacifiers can be really complex and complex buildings. But if you take it back to uh, the basics, um, if you get the basics right, then uh, it should be achievable. So, so thanks for that. Um, if we could just ask everybody if you've got any questions, put them in the chat. Uh, there's a few coming through. Um, I've got a few of my my own as well, um, and I'm going to start with one of those just while we allow some more to come through. Um, so give, given that the dwelling was built 10 years ago and, and you've continued on your uh, sort of pacifist journey, what, what would you do differently uh, today um, to, you know, that, that uh, experience 10 years ago? Certainly, I, I would uh, do differently. I, I would start properly at the start by get the running the plans through the passive house planning package um and by doing that then i would know better that i'm not overdoing something as well now i i we do overdo it a little the the likes of the the walls the uh, and the floor and all you, you're looking 0.15 watts per meter squared Kelvin, we would now go down to 0.13. And um, so we're not trying to achieve it on the very minimum standards. And that would give you a little come and go elsewhere. I, sorry, just on that, um, that we did do one there um, where we used all the passive house components and everything as it should be. And I think it was a quite quite a fine example. When we we thought we were fairly good on it, but when we put it through the passive house planning package, it came in at uh, 33 watts per meter squared Kelvin or, or per, per meter squared for the heating load. And to to bring that back to 15, uh, we had to put two extra windows in the south 
elevation and cut a 30 foot hedge down to eight feet or 2.4 meters. And that was all it took to half the heating load. Okay, um, yeah, thanks Thanks for that, uh, Willie. Um, so I've got a couple of questions from uh, Colm. Uh, one um, in relation to your uh, front door letterbox. So uh, it, it, someone uh, really kind of spotting something in the presentation, which I didn't pick up on, I must admit. Um, so, so the question there is, uh, did that cause you any issues with air tightness? And then this, the second question um, was uh, around the, the chimney. Um, obviously, there's there's lots of debate about uh, fire stoves in passive house buildings. Um, I've got one in mind, so you know I'm I'm with you. Um, but in terms of the the chimney ceiling, uh, or or you know what challenges did you have? I suppose with both of those items, and how did you overcome them? Well, uh, this the, the letter box. Um, I'm not sure if the letter box, the letter box is there. I'm not sure if it's actually working because it's never, the postman never comes there. He always drops in through the back door. Um, and I don't know if the, the letter box is actually working in that house, but it's like two letter boxes. It's, it's pretty difficult to open. Uh, but the chimney, yes, uh, did create problems there's no two ways about it but I've overcome that by building the membrane through the chimney at, at, at the building stage now and uh, the, then you know that means then I tip my membrane to that so I have no issue with getting it airtight. Okay um, and did, did you use any special flues or uh, or was there anything special about the, the stove really? Um, well, the stove itself would be pretty airtight. Now, I, I, admittedly, there's two doors on the stove. A single door stove seems to be better when it comes to air tightness. But um, no, I'm pretty impressed with that one there. The, the, the air going into it comes in underneath the insulation level. So if it's cold, when it's cold coming in, it doesn't affect the, the heat in the floor. Um, but no, it's ordinary, just uh, it's ordinary flues, and then the flexible flue comes down and it's sealed from top to bottom and then done around with uh, the vermiculite um, to insulate it so that the first puff of smoke heats it up and takes the flue gas out. Yeah, um, no, I, I know. I know from my my own research that the and for for anyone who's interested, there was a, a German standard which I don't think is current anymore. Um, but some stoves uh, met that German standard, which was around air tightness and also trying to deal with that issue when you open the stove, particularly with in an airtight house, um, about getting backdraft. Um, so there, yeah. I, I can't recall the the, the, the standard. Uh, it was a, a D-bit standard from Germany, but some stoves meet that, uh, and they're supposedly the, the, the better ones to look at. Um, I've got a question from uh, Paul McAllister, um, just asking, at the time, how much extra do you think it cost to uh, build compared to building reg standards, um, you know, ignoring uh, things like PV and, and anything that wasn't, you know, some of those extras that wouldn't necessarily have been part of a, a typical build, but in terms of getting to the passive house performance. Who's Paul McAllister? <laughs> <laughs> Paul, good to see you. Um, that one there, Paul, it was 7 to 10%. It was a pretty straightforward bungalow. Now, if you were to go into something like a story and a half um, or dormer windows or things like that, you know, for a, a, a standard build, a dormer window is structurally sound and um, watertight, you know, for us, we have to look at thermal bridging and insulation and air tightness. So, you know, things like that put a lot more to it. But that w one there um, was 7 to 10% more. Than a standard. Okay, thanks, Willie. Um, and I guess you know it's worth saying as as building regs uh, 
improve that that gap should come down but i think you also made the point in your presentation that although there may be additional cost you're you're buying additional quality you're buying a healthy building um so you know it's not a, a it, there's added value i suppose is what, what, I'm, what i'm trying to to say rather badly um I've got another question from uh, uh, Barry, um, who's just asking, and, and sim similar on the cost things, but uh, did the clustering of the wet rooms save much uh, in terms of uh, construction costs um, or in predicted energy? Uh, probably didn't do a lot on the costing of that, but it certainly, um, th there's really, there's very, very little pipe work and uh, I think instead of using, you know, like a, a, a 20 mil copper, we were down to 15 mil, um, I think it was HEP. Uh, you know, so uh, I'm always quite aggravated when I go to a tap and turn on the hot water and I have to wait for hot water. Um, so this, this was a pet hit of mine and this was why I was trying to overcome it. Uh, but certainly it would save, there's no doubt about it, it would save. Uh, but what we did put pipes in the studs for radiators because we weren't sure if we needed many. We just put in three radiators, but we left pipes for a radiator in every room. Uh, and as, as I said, we only put in two additional radiators in rooms that's not used much within the house because uh, uh, to, to dump heat the, from the solar tubes of three kilowatts of solar hot water tubes on the roof. And in the summertime, they were overheating and uh, going into stagnation on us. Uh, the lady wouldn't let us put one in her bedroom. She said uh, her bedroom was perfect and didn't need anything else. Okay, um, questions are coming thick and fast now, so that's good. Um, <laughs> Uh, related to that, I suppose, um, Dominic Convery asks, have you thought of any other ways to heat hot water at the tap? Um, so, for example, would a, would a boiling tap micro water heater uh, be a better method as opposed to piping um, uh, domestic hot water across uh, floors from the hot water cylinder? I, I think this is something we, we, we're beginning to see in particularly things like schools uh, where um, it's point of use, uh, direct electric heating, but I'm not sure whether it, it, it stacks up for um, uh, domestic, but yeah, interesting to hear your thoughts on that, Willie. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I would agree with that, actually. Um, done a wee bit of experimenting here at home. Um, for example, my shower at home, uh, a 10 minute shower will use 100 litres of, of water. Uh, it takes three and a half litres before I get hot water. But then where I have an electric shower, the electric shower only uses 40 uh, litres in a 10 minute shower. And I have hot water in three quarters of a litre's time. So, yes, um, I think there is uh, an argument there for heating at, at the point of use. And that would involve, if you had an ensuite further away, that you would have uh, um, something to heat the water for both the shower and the, the, the sink. Because most people don't wait on hot water at the sink if they were washing their hands. Um, and and uh, as he has put there, to the, the hot water tap there, you know, there's the, the something new in the kitchen. Uh, but yes, I, I personally think that, yes, there is a market for that there. The only thing you would have to be careful with if you're bringing hot water that or cold water th through the house, that would have to be insulated and vapor sealed to keep it from condensing. Okay. Um, that was uh, uh, pretty complicated. Yeah, great to hear your research on this stuff. Uh, <laughs> it's really good. Um, Christopher Moore asks, um, in relation to your uh, air intake, uh, what's the typical temperature of the underground ducted air um, compared to normal ambient um, during the heating season? Um, never really measured, but at the time we were told it would on the ground it would maintain uh, six degrees. Uh, now, we did surround it in soil because they said soil was... 
um, the better um, at retaining the same temperature, if you know what I mean. I probably put it in too deep at the time, uh, but we had to leave a trap then in it so it, it couldn't build up water, if you know what I mean. Um, and we used pretty big ducts in it so it wouldn't um, it wouldn't hurt the heat recovery unit trying to draw air from it. Okay. Um, oh, here's another one. Um, so Richard Kenny's uh, uh, making a comment. Um, just uh, nobody seems to refer to to this point, but is 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 there a way to access the duct work for future cleaning? So um, uh, in relation to the MVHR. Um, I don't know if you've done any research in this area, Willie. Um, again, it's a, it's a question lot that, that comes up quite quite a lot, uh, just in relation to ducts and whether they're going to need uh, um, uh, cleaning cleaning out. But uh, again, maybe your experience around uh, that, Willie. Uh, yep. Yeah. If you use the proper duct work that doesn't um, have the same static, uh, it was actually Thomas that uh, explained this to me. Uh, when he did his house, the the camera, the ducts after so many years, and the ducts were clean, barring one point where they had used a piece of um, like sure pipe, you know, a bit of ordinary pipe, and and it had gathered. You, you know, if you look at a, a um, an extractor fan, uh, and you open it, that duct has gathered um, like fibers. Uh, that have sort of clung to the, the external of the duct, but I haven't seen that happening to that uh, or the internal of the, the external wall of the duct, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and I, and I think also worth adding, Willie, that you know, the, the MVHR units have filters in them, and, and even yep. the um, extract valves in in the wet rooms would have a, a filter element. Uh, certainly, some of them do uh, uh, to you know just to catch any dust. Um, and I think the the first pass of house in, in Darmstadt's Wolfgang's uh, Faison house, I'm pretty sure they uh, did some dismantling of that fairly recently, which, um, you know, where they looked at all of these things, you know, the, the, the cleanliness of the ducts, the longevity of uh, air tightness taping, and, you know, find everything to be pretty much as good as, as, as the day it was installed. So I, I, think, I think, again, it goes down to quality of installation, quality of storage uh, on site, you know, making sure the ducts aren't lying there with the ends open and all of these kinds of things. So it comes back to the, the quality control aspect of, um, um, of, of, of the standard. Um, Christopher Moore asks, and this is in relation to your, uh, the, your, your placement of your uh, intake, um, did you measure the improvement in, in oxygen levels uh, by placing the air intact cl close to the trees or, or is that a bit of a gut feel uh, type um, uh, thing? Um, no, I didn't measure it, uh, Christopher. And I, when I was putting it in, I mentioned it to a guy, uh, it was actually a German guy, and I was explaining to him what, what I was doing. And maybe a week later, he came back to me and he said, I've been thinking about what you're doing. And he said, when I was a child, I had glandular fever. And he says, we live beside a forest. And the only place I could go that I wasn't sick was out and sit in the forest. And that was uh, one of the reasons that I went ahead with it. Okay, um, we've probably got a couple of minutes and then we'll, we'll go to our, our breakout rooms. So, I mean, maybe to finish off, Willie, I just wanted to ask the question, maybe roll a couple of things uh, in together. Um, first of all, how, how has this project, I suppose, influenced everything you've done since? Um, and secondly, uh, I, I know a lot of your team are... Um, uh, qualified through the past five tradespersons uh, course, I'd be interested to hear just you know what the response from you know the team, the guys that are that are working for you um, to to the past five uh, standard and you know, how how have they found that uh, transition or, or or maybe it wasn't much of a transition for them but just that experience. Uh, well, when I started this house in particular ten years ago, 
um, they were looking for a room in the local institution for me. Uh, so they, they, they just couldn't understand what was wrong with me. Um, but then as they went along and they realised just how good the house was, um, for a lot of them that went about with a wee chip on their shoulder, you know, and they're sort of proud now of their achievements and they're all looking into it. So, um, and they would come with wee ideas, if you know what I mean. Um, now, so yeah, it, it definitely helped them and uh, they know now that they are producing a good product. And uh, yeah, for a tradesman, it's, um, it's good and it's what a tradesman likes to do. Yeah, no, that's... Uh... That's good to hear. Okay, well, thanks very much, Willie, for your presentation and answering, you know, uh, all those questions and uh, uh, you know, sharing your experience and and, and knowledge with us. Um, just going to ask Yvonne now if she could. Uh,